Bienvenidos. Bienvenidos. Hoy nos tenemos la honra o privilegio de tener nuestra comunidad un diálogo muy to have a very special dialogue in our community of two incredible people, two wonderful people that you're about to meet. We are very grateful for the opportunity that this community gives us, and we would like to thank the foundation, Paulo Pajecki, which enables us to bring down to Brazil professors such as Susana Heschel and others who have been with us. And I ask you for a round of applause to Paulo Pajecki, to our foundation. And if you want to send us a, an instant payment for us, this will be OK. We are starting today Susana Heschel's week in Sao Paulo. This is her second time in Brazil. She came down here. 30 years ago for ECHO 92, and she was a member of a panel with the Dalai Lama, among others. She spoke about the college and Judaism at that time. And this is the second time she comes to Brazil. And for our Kehila, this is a very important honor to have her with us starting this uh, journey, which will be intense. And I hope that those of you who are here and the others in Latin America in several countries that are going to follow up with us in these events that are going to be uh, uh, sent directly to you via YouTube. We also have Edu Lira, one of the young talents of Brazil, a person who is revolutionizing the world in how to understand human dignity and transforming Brazilian slums with his project, Bringing Up Falcons, which is a success all over the world. And we had had already an online event with Edu Lira, and now we have him in person. And the idea to have this dialogue among the two of them on human dignity, both Abraham Joshua Heschel and Professor Susanna Heschel work with this subject, and obviously Edu Lira with his important energy. We will give the time for each of them to speak, and then we will open up for Q&A. I also want to mention two important points. We are uh, transmitting this event in Portuguese, English, and Spanish, and we thank the translators who will thank us will help us to uh, translate into the various languages. The only language that has no translation is my portuñol. This is outside the program. This is my personal charm. You, have, you are used already with this uh, charm of mine. Susana thinks that I'm speaking English, Portuguese, so don't tell her. <laughs> so let's start, ladies first. Very much thank you, Rabbi Gottfried, for inviting me here. And I would like to say what a pleasure and honor it is for me to be with you in the great work that you do, Edulira. I'm very happy to be here in Brazil. And thank you for inviting me to your community. I want to say a few words about dignity. The Hebrew word for dignity is kavod. Kavod has many meanings. The root can mean heavy, it can mean honor, can mean dignity. And when it's used in the Bible, it's used as kavod Hashem, the kavod of God, which means the glory of God a meaning that actually we don't have in modern Hebrew. But kavod can mean dignity and it can mean honor. What's the difference between dignity and honor? Just briefly, I'm only going to speak a few minutes now and we'll have a discussion. Who has
has dignity? And how do we gain dignity? In Jewish law, a corpse, a dead body, has dignity. A person who is dead doesn't feel or know anything. But we are obligated, we are commanded as Jews to treat the corpse with dignity. We gain our own dignity when we convey dignity to a corpse or to another person. Dignity is something that isn't simply inherent. It's something that we give. And in giving, we receive. We become people of dignity. And I think that's very important for us. We can come back to that, but I want to also mention there are many implications of this. For example, a person who is hanged for a crime, you never leave the body out because the body of a person who is hanged is said in rabbinic literature to be the identical twin of the Kaddish Borach of God, the twin of God. The human being's dignity is closely connected to the dignity of God. To treat another person with contempt or with shame is as if you are giving shame and contempt toward God. But what about the difference between dignity and honor? What is the difference? And this becomes something important also politically since the Second World War. I think everyone knows that in Germany, the constitution that was written after 1945 begins with the statement of the inviolable dignity of the human being. Inviolable. And it's held up by the Supreme Court in Germany. Dignity of the human being, the individual. But there are many other countries around the world that wrote constitutions after World War II in which they also used the word dignity, but they applied the dignity to the country, to the culture, to the people at large as a collective. The problem is when someone is accused of violating the dignity of the culture, even in a case where the person's individual dignity might be in conflict. For example, female genital mutilation is regarded as a violation of the dignity of the human being, the woman. And yet, in some courts, to outlaw female genital mutilation violates the dignity of the culture. So that's an example of the clash between dignity of the individual and dignity of the culture. But the other level is the word honor. When you think about honor, what comes to mind? Who has honor? And how is honor violated? And how is honor defended? Dignity. A person of dignity. Imagine such a person, a person of dignity. A person, on the other hand, of honor. The difference in the terms also comes up in court cases. Who has dignity? And who has honor? The violation of honor is something that makes people angry and leads to revenge. A violation of dignity brings a sense of internal shame and sorrow and hurt and pain. 
Honor is restored by a duel, by a war, by anger. Dignity can never be restored through revenge. Revenge does not restore dignity. So one question we might think about is as a society, are we a society of honor or are we a society of dignity? Which is more important to us? My last point is about one verse in the Bible, chapter 10, verse 1 of the book of Exodus, when God says to Moses, Bo el paro ki hechbarati et libo, come to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart. Does everybody know that verse? Yeah? But I leave you with this. There is a commentary by one of my ancestors, Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, a Hasidic Rebbe, in his, say, in his book, his Sefer, his commentary, called Kedushas Levi, and he says this, God says to Moses, come to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart. The word is kavod. Kavod can mean hard or heavy, but it can also mean dignity. Levi Yitzchak says, God said to Moses, I have made Pharaoh's heart capable of dignity. But why does he say that? Because a few sukim, a few verses later, Pharaoh says, Chatasi, I have sinned. And Levi Yitzchak says, how do we come to repent? Only a person who has a sense of dignity is capable of saying, I have sinned. I have to start over. Dignity is the essence of being a person, of having a life worth living, of having respect for oneself and from others. I think that interpretation is an important one for all of us. To be capable of repentance means we need dignity. I come to you from the United States where there is madness, wickedness, corruption at the highest levels. I see fellow Americans standing in front of Trump, mocking other human beings. Mockery is the way to destroy one's own dignity. And I ask myself today, how will we ever restore their dignity? How can they restore their dignity? These mad people, my fellow Americans. And I think of that verse, will God make them capable again of some human dignity. Thank you. Um prazer estar aqui com vocês. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I was saying when I arrived here, well, my English is very bad. Therefore, just to give you an idea, I met Warren Buffett in the US a few years ago. And I asked to have a picture with him. And instead of saying, can I take a picture with you? I said, can we take a shower together? Ele está traduzindo. Bom, 
well, this made a great confusion, but I think that, uh, uh, well, of course, he didn't want to, sh to shower with me, but the uh, rabbi uh, is bringing, Ad Adrian is bringing the headset for our guest of honor. But imagine if he had uh, said, okay, I would have solved Brazilian problems in a shower. Lenny introduced me to the Quran. I think it's the Talmud. And uh, in our house, we didn't have books. It's the Torah, not the Quran. Yeah, I apologize for the confusion. But uh, the Torah, Lenny introduced me to the Torah. And I was saying that I know all the stories of the Torah. And I was uh, alphabetized in with the Quran because there were no books. And when I went to Israel, uh, I visited the Kotel Amaravi, and it was a very, very important trip for me. And uh, I had never visited the synagogue before. Once, it's very special to be with you. Once in London, I met a rabbi And he's very important. And uh, his name is Jonathan Sachs. And uh, I had a very important lesson with him. And I wanted to tell you in a few words, when we speak about dignity, the contrary of poverty is not richness. The contrary of uh, poverty is dignity. The opposite of it is dignity. So the motor of every, the drive, driving force behind everything I do in the Brazilian slums is uh, implementing dignity in all these uh, these uh, slums. Brazil has 14,000 slums all over the country, and we have covered over 40% of the social territories uh, uh, with our work of citizenry and economic development. And our mission, we exist because with time we want to transform the slums poverty in a museum treasury. And I think this is an honor, a matter of honor for Brazil. We have to win and become, overcome what should never have existed, this obscene inequality existing in our country. And we win and overcome this. And I think how to overcome this? Our uh, question should be how to implement dignity in territories that, that are neglected and violated by the Brazilian uh, state. I just uh, came back from Minas Gerais, and we visited an operation in the inlands of Minas Gerais. I work with slums. And uh, in the Sertão, the Brazilian Sertão, the Brazilian uh, uh, inland, is also in dire need because the slums are next to us. They are around us, around your beautiful synagogue and the beautiful, beautiful uh, work supporting their needs with food. But in the inland of Brazil, in the Brazilian Sertão, there is nothing of this. No one helps them. And I met a young boy, Otero, and he has a beautiful history. He wasn't born in the slums like me. He was not poor like me. He has a different story. He is not a, a, a leader like I am today in the, in the edge. He's a center leader. And I asked him, how? Did you uh, uh, conquer that? How could you do this? And he said, one day I was entering a shopping mall in um, Belo Horizonte, and I saw a black kid. And I asked him, what do you want? He was begging there. And he said, I just want to buy a cookie. And he didn't, wasn't allowed to enter the shopping mall because he was black. and. I started to to talk to him. I studied I studied the programming. I am studying different things. And he asked me, "What's the difference 
between you and me because you're white and I'm black. And you cannot judge a person by the color of their skin. And therefore, I saw that his heart was squeezed. And I met his wife, as, uh, the one who, uh, of the boy, he, the man he was speaking before. I met his wife. She's a huge woman, a wonderful person. She's transforming all the community of the inland of Brazil. And he is far from everything, far from, his si from himself, far from drinking water. And I asked him, how can you be so happy? He said, the more that I give away my privileges, the happier I am. I came back so impacted with that. And the way we implement is when we have uh, the courage to give up our personal privileges. And uh, you have to give away your privileges and you have to you have to get to uh, succeed to do what you had to do and reach those that for some reason, we're not, uh, we're neglected, we're not contemplated. And dignity and honor is something that I didn't understand very well uh, from what uh, our, our guests spoke because I don't understand fully English. But uh, there is something we have to know. What can we do with that? The number of, of uh, slums doubled in the last decade. And uh, 93 million people live in slums. And Brazil is rich. Brazil is, is unfair. Brazil is very rich. It has almost five trillion in the federal budget. We have to find a way of raising up against this inequality in, an in, uh, in, a, in a very strong way. And we have to do this in the next two decades. So completing. My contribution is that we are prototyping a solution called uh, 3D uh, slum in which we combine public policies and uh, we have to cut the cycle of poverty. And one of these territories, the magic slum, is where we are getting to zero uh, illiteracy and have a margin of 70% of the 9.5 of the unemployment in Brazil. And in six months, the unemployment got down to 19%. And uh, by 2025, uh, we will have a totally free slum. And we have to uh, prove that it's possible to be part of a generation that will deliver the new and transforming to the society. What we need is to have an attitude as a large people who thinks large, who does something big. And I inspire myself in your history. I just came back from Tel Aviv. It is so surprising the innovations that your people is creating, prototyping and doing there. Someone told me something that marked me, stroked me very much. He told me when I was born, Israel already existed. But I want to live in such a way that when I die, Israel will be even better, different. So I came back thinking on the fact that when I was born, slums already existed. But when I die, maybe slums will be transformed, better developed. So the five years for us cycle, the five year cycle for us is nothing. Maybe it's nothing for mankind. But for us, our cycle in this in in the world is 50 60 years and when we were born the problems were here already but when we die maybe this pain this despair will have been uh, softened because we rose against all this in a strategic way i will close my words conclude by saying i have no hope i am hope Thank you.
suggestions, questions for Eduardo? Oh, yeah. I'm very moved and I'm very inspired by all that you do and by what you said. And I, I also appreciate very much the hope and the goals. I think it's very important for us to have goals that you established today. As goals are important, but hope. I think too often we say it's a problem is overwhelming and we can't bear to begin. And sometimes what we need is a voice like yours to say, no, we begin now and we do it together. So thank you. Thank you for that. Brazil is one of the most unequal countries in, in the world. And we have to overcome this inequality. The gap between rich and poor is growing larger every, every day and everywhere in the world. It's a global phenomenon. And that needs to be addressed by all of us, together, wherever we live. What can we do about that? Um, it's, we need an economic restructuring. Uh, it's also affected us as human beings. We had in the United States very wealthy people, always. You know what Jesus said, the wealthy are always going to be with you, what can you do? You know, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> um, but there used to be an attitude on the part of the wealthy of trying to help all of society build institutions, build universities and hospitals. And now that attitude is gone. And this is being discussed in the United States. Very wealthy people are not interested in the welfare of the country. Okay, that's one point. But there's another point. Where does the wealth come from? Wealth is built on wealth, one generation after another. Wealth begins with wealth. What worries us, and I'm a professor at an Ivy League university. One of my colleagues, Craig Wilder, published a book about universities and enslavement. The wealth that came to build the universities in the United States came from people who enslaved other people. It came from slavery. That's where the wealth in the United States began. And our universities were built on that wealth. Much else was also built on that wealth including churches, synagogues. We have a lot to repent for. And I think as Jews, we have much to be proud of. As you just said, Edu, what we did, you know, I have a friend Christian theologian in Germany, Siegfried Virgels, he said, you don't walk out of Auschwitz with a smile on your face. And yet, we built a country, and it's an amazing country that has much to give the world. And it's a country that has serious political problems also that we know about. But I think as Jews, we have reason to be proud, very proud of our tradition and our accomplishments but we also have things to repent for. And we should never let our pride get in the way of the need to repent. To say, chatasi, 
We should have the dignity as Jews to be able to say, yes, I, we've also done some wrong things. And we need to do tshuva. We need to repent. We need to make up also. And that, too, can be a light to the nations, a model to the world. of What it means to be a person who can say, I'm proud, and I also have sinned. Okay. Uh, A round of applause to this woman. Such powerful words. Well, I'm very happy that I was invited to be here. I have the opportunity today of learning a lot and become someone better. I will try now to uh, give a summary on our on my work bringing up falcons generating falcons i was born in a slum my parents took me out of the hospital took me to a uh, barrack with the cement the no cement on the floor but uh, uh, iron on the floor and they didn't have money to buy a bed for me. I was, I, they put me to sleep in a bathtub. My father went to the world of crime, was uh, incarcerated, and I visited my father in prison. But I saw my mother look in my eyes and tell me every day, son, it's not important where you came from in life. The important point is where you're going to. This is the most important thing in the world. So the environment told me in a virus, you cannot. And my mother told me every day, you can. They are lying to you, you can. My mother is my fr fortress, she's alive. She was a daily maid and uh, b brought me up with this money, my father, uh, uh, finished his term in prison, and uh, 11 years ago, we, we created this uh, generating or bringing up falcons, and we fed a whole city of Campinas, so what to say, for months during the pandemic, and due to what my mother said, mothers always have reason, I participated in the World Forum as one of the Brazilian young people who can change the world, one of the 100 most influential young men in the world, according to the UN, and several other titles. So I think that my history is a tremendous history of exception. But this is the driving force of generating falcons. And I think that Brazilian slums have a lot of vulnerability, but also a lot of power. This is a mix. And power is like a time bomb. You know that it's going to explode at any moment. And you need to disarm it. So you need three things. A deep technical knowledge, not to cut the wrong uh, string. Second, you have to be tender. You cannot take on your hands a time bomb in with the uh, haste. You have to be delicate to deal with vulnerability. And third, you have to be courageous, courageous, very courageous. So my work is to disarm time bombs in a scale. We have to do this before it's too late. And the time is now. Susana, what's your father? I will do the first uh, question. Susana, what would your father think about this uh, situation in which we live? Poverty, dignity, rights. Being Jewish or not Jewish. So when we ask you to write the new introduction for our book, you write a little bit about your father will will say in 2022. So you, your father will say it to this day. What are your thoughts about that? It's 
So, from my father, first of all, the most important thing is not that we live as individuals, but to recognize how dependent we are on other people. The most wonderful experience in a human life is to love and to be loved. And the most devastating is when someone you love dies. So we're very bound up with one another. You know that my father f grew up in Warsaw. His father died when my father was nine years old. And my father's mother and sisters were very, very poor. My father was, uh, his hands were swollen because they had been frostbitten so many times. And, uh, and so it was a struggle. And when he came to this country, and we, I grew up in New York City, he always spoke to me about his life and about the lives of people around us. We lived at the edge of Harlem. And my father talked to me always about the poverty in the United States, a country that was so rich, it was inconceivable that children go to bed hungry in a country like that. Where's the conscience of the world? You know, in Jewish law, you can't eat your dinner until you fed your animals. You must feed them first. Then you can eat. We have two dogs in my house, so we know this, and we follow that commandment. But just think to yourself, this is a commandment from God. Do you think for a moment that God would say it's permissible for us to have dinner when fellow human beings have no dinner to eat? It's inconceivable. Why isn't it stated in the Ten Commandments? Because I think it was inconceivable to the Kaddish Baruch to God, inconceivable to God that we would sit down and eat our dinner while fellow human beings were hungry. God could not imagine such a thing. So we have responsibility. My father used to say, there's a big difference between a question and a problem. A question has an answer. A problem doesn't have a simple answer. But my father said, show me a person who says, I have no problem, and I'll show you a fool. <laughs> we have problems, and we need to face them. And I'll just say, as you may know, my father was very involved with the civil rights movement in America and very close to Dr. Martin Luther King. And they often gave lectures together. And they had a close personal friendship, which I have also with his children. But when my father came back from the march in Selma in 1965, he said, I felt my legs were praying. That is, to get up and do something for social justice is itself a form of prayer. And that's an old Jewish idea. You know, in the Talmud it says, God prays. What do you mean, God prays? What does God pray? God prays. May my compassion rule me. May my compassion guide me. So God prays. And so I think we have something to learn from that too, how we too can pray and how prayer can change the world. Preguntas. Questions now.
My question is to the two of you. Since we are born in Judaism, the most interesting thing we learn is to do something that remains and that reaches many. So it's very common to have a room in a school that has the name of a family. And the name of a small candle at the entrance of the synagogue in honor of someone who passed away. And this money, is these funds are used for something larger. The uh, food program, scholarships for those who cannot pay school. And the most beautiful thing is to be able to have in your life the condition to help you to do something like that. To put the name of my mother in this school. I built a, a room in the daycare center in the name of my grandma. And do something for others. And what I see, and I question to the two of you, is how to generate that in a more collective way. So the dignity that you give and the others receive should have collective value. Because in our century, I see that we are losing the notion of dignity. And the notion of power, it's taking its place. So the beautiful is to see the football player who came from the slums to have five foreign cars and not to pave the other street in the slum number so and so. This is what they consider beautiful. And the group, the population, think that it is cool that millionaires and football players live in luxury but do nothing for the collective. And the collective thinks this is cool. This is not something that is, that, uh, is seen as something natural, something that has to be returned. They think that they are an example of uh, dreams come true. No, but no. And therefore, I ask you how to incentivize dignity instead of the show of power and narcissism. I think that people copycat what they see in the other side of the wall. They see the others with huge cars. They want to have an equal car. They want to have the same tennis shoes. They want to say, have the same house. So they copycat behaviors. But our challenge is to have, this is what I try to encourage people to have, to have a long-term thinking head. The most important things are not done in the short term. You do not build a marriage in the short term. You don't learn English in the short term. You don't build your career in the short term. This is always a journey, a long-term journey. And regardless of where the person was born, I think that there is a huge difference between being rich and being elite. What is the rich one? The rich one perhaps is so poor that the only thing he has is money. And the concept of richness is connected to a shed concept. The shed only receives and saves, does not redistribute, and it remains with him for always. So rich people cannot share a dream. They do not influence others. They hide themselves. You talk to the assistant, to the secretary. But the elite has a totally different concept. It's the elite of the first platoon that take others on, that influences, that create, that delivers. This is more a DC concept, distribution center, than what than a shed uh, concept. He receives, he distributes, he improves society, he makes, builds something perennial that is a legacy. And I think that Brazil needs more and more, less riches and more uh, elites, elites that donate, elites that create richness, that 
donate, that fights inequality, that creates opportunities and makes the world a better place to live. This is our challenge, I think, as a citizen, when you bring up your, you raise your kids in the slum. Because we, if we ask who is the rich one and who is the poor one, who really needs more? So perhaps someone is poor in terms of money, but is rich in attitudes, in courage, in dreams. Wherever I speak, I say this, I was never poor. The only thing I didn't have was money. But I had so much courage. I stood up and said, let's move on. Let's build something big. So every time I found a friend who is a Forbes analyst, I say, the only thing you have more than me is money. That's why I'm asking money to you. But I have so much things that is a worth gold, the respect of the slum. I navigate there and here equally. So to make the world a rich place and dignified place, we have to join the two richnesses. We have to join the two richesses. The, the world has lots of walls. We have to put the walls down and bring and build up bridges. So the slum boys will know that they don't need the car to be someone. And the ones on this side of the wall will understand that value is something different. Value depends on the coexistence. Because Susanna said something very important. How can we eat and sleep knowing that 33 million people didn't eat? And this Brazil has to learn with the favela, with the slum. In the slum, if one has food, the others also have. If one person has a blanket, no one feels cold because they call, they work and prove what a community is. Community. Good evening, congratulations to the two of our guests. And one question of someone who doesn't know and wants to learn from you. How were you able to improve teaching and learning in the slum? I studied in public schools and for several years we tried here to help a public school. We set up a program of donation, uh, stimulus to teachers, and we were not able to move on because we were not able to intercede in, uh, in education because the state didn't allow us. Please tell us how do you, uh, how did you achieve this? And if there is time, please tell us something about health because you didn't mention health. I have Dennis here, and we just. Uh, established a telemedicine uh, booth in the slum where the slum uh, residents will enter this booth and will have the same treatment that we, the people pay fortune here. My dear friends who are here, Ellie Sigal, the daughter of my dear friend Avi Sigal, also Jew, and also Dennis, who's helping me implement telemedicine in the slums. So I am sure we have to innovate. That's why I like to be next to you Jews and to go to Israel. You were innovating there. You were persecuted your whole life. And to get out of persecution, you have to innovate. And this is part of the, your DNA. I visited the Tel Aviv University. I'm sending one of my collaborators to send to study in the Tel Aviv University the bears the diamonds and Sarah uh, and her husband who had had me in Mariano and Sarah don't you remember them well they hosted me in Tel Aviv in their home <coughs> I think it would be very important to listen 
to Susanna on education, it's important. But I will answer quickly, briefly what you said. Now my, my story with Rabbi Sachs, Zichrono Levracha, comes here. He says that the basic point of education is to know where the person came from and knowing where he wants to get to. He told me, you know what's the beauty of educating? He said, when you educate someone, you raise the person. No racism, no machi machoism reduces because education elevated the person. So what we have done in the slums is create a technical uh, upbringing trail tracks as if we were setting up factories in the slum geared to employment, citizenry therefore, full citizenry, because employment is uh, guided by uh, the, 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 the financial result. But what we are doing here, for instance, is citizenry. We need to elevate ourselves through citizen, citizenry. And through these technical tracks we build, we have another quote unquote factory with the productive inclusion methods to place these uh, youngsters in uh, at work. And the most uh, delicate nerve in the human body is the pocket. <laughs> because if you see uh, um, the head of a family crying in front of his children, we have to get there before this happens. We cannot be attacked. We have to bring love and opportunity to everybody. I have the, 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 the strong uh, belief in inclusion. We have to a uh, line of 30% and get to 19% and by December get to zero unemployment. And th thus we'll be able to change logic and lack of probability. I'm here, he here in front of you as the son of a uh, man in jail. And this is the magics of education. Good evening. First of all, I want to thank you all for the opportunity. And as you said, someone, my friend here said, I want to congratulate you for the, uh, for the richness you're bringing to us. The key word I heard from you is the word dignity. And I would like to hear from you on the following. When we try to change a cultural value, something important, of course, we always have a good fight in two fronts, one an internal front and an external front. So I would like to hear from both of you, how has it been, how has been your challenge in rescuing dignity in your own communities? And at the same time, to give external limits to what we know that is outside from us sometimes, and that sometimes helps, sometimes doesn't. So how is this internal external work in this movement of rescuing dignity of people that you bros are so keen on? Thank you. So um, ask you a question. Let's say you're walking by the ocean and you see, God forbid, two people drowning a man and a woman. Whom do you say first? What is Jewish law? Man. You save the life of a man first. His life takes precedence because a Jewish man has more commandments to fulfill. Um, I could give you additional examples in the Bible. If a husband suspects his wife of adultery, he takes her to the priest, and the priest takes off her clothes and her hair and so forth and makes her drink something. Sexual assault is what we call it. It's criminal. Um, what do I do as a woman 
when I see in my religion, not only in the Talmud, but in the Bible, too, examples of not only where my dignity is not respected, but actually violated, what do I do with that? So I would say you asked, how do I, how do I restore my dignity? All I can tell you is, when I was a small child, I used to say, it's for a woman to sit behind the curtain in the synagogue. That may be what men want, but that's not what God wants. And somehow I knew that. I think that human beings, all of us, have inside, we're born with a moral compass. We actually know what is right and what is wrong. Even when it goes against our own scripture, Bible. And I have to believe in that. And I have to believe that I do know what's right and what's wrong. And some laws in Judaism are wrong. I know that. Some people behave in terrible ways. But somehow I have the inner strength to know what's right and to have faith that in the way I treat other people, that when I treat other people with dignity, I become a person of dignity and they become people of dignity. And that's where it begins to restore our society morally. That's my answer to you. Good evening. Uma pergunta para o. Good evening. Good evening. My question is to Eduardo. I want to tell you that in my school, we have one of the subjects called entrepreneurial project. One of the topics is sensitivity, and we chose you for this topic. And the interesting point is that as and when we read the texts, we were moved increasingly more with your story. And I want, therefore, to pose you a question. Where did you take this willpower? That's it. <laughs> How, what did you do to face all these difficulties and raise yourself up to this height and do what you do? What, what's your name, my dear? Andrea. Great. Nice to meet you, and thank you very much. Andrea. I love to see the younger people in these meetings, because in thesis, you have something that everybody would like to pay a lot of money for that. You have more future than past. Therefore, your generation has a very important role in Brazil and in the world to find a way of winning inequality and save Brazil and the world from the climate collapse. I have a stepdaughter your age, 13 years old, and I look at her and, said, and say, how many skills I have to develop in her so that they can reach there? But they are developing skills in me. I am less macho, I deal better with women, we have two, I have two step uh, girls, and this makes me a better person facing the world. And having said that, I have always had in mind that I want to go on up front, going towards the front. Because during the day along my life, I always dealt with many obstacles, many uh, walls, but the greatest of all the 
uh, obstacles and walls were not the real ones, were the imaginary, emotional obstacles. So the whole time I heard, you won't get there, you are not rich, your English is terrible, and all the negative things, but I promised myself, it do. You will, you will not hamper this thought to come in your um, to mind. They are always there clapping on you, and and when it comes to mind, receive these thoughts, leave it, leave them, don't fight these thoughts. And I promised myself that even when these thoughts come to mind, and when the days are worst, I will always go on walking towards up front walking up front. This is the rule, backwards, only to take a leap and go forward. Because the idea of these bad thoughts is to have a stopping. And if we stop, the world stops. I do believe in something. I'll share it with you. If you change, those who change, change everything. Those that do not change, don't change anything. And when we change up front, we are changing all the time. So I don't allow myself to stop. I'm always deciding. I'm going, always going up front. I'm go, always there. Well, good evening. First, I want to congratulate the community for this meeting. In fact, putting together Susanna Heschel and Edu Lira, this elevates all of us. And having said that, I want to share with you that I have a very serious concern as a Jew. So my question is directed especially to you, Susanna. I would like to f follow on something uh, Edu mentioned twice. He mentioned twice the fact that we have to improve things the way they are in the world. Because in fact, one of the main norms and values of the human, of the Jewish people is Tikkun Olam. I live in Israel in a kibbutz, which is based in total solidarity values. And what I see in Israel and in the Jewish people overall is an inverse road to our values. There is a distancing from our responsibility towards the world, towards the improving the world, towards respecting the dignity of the other, the other being other peoples. The Jewish community used to fall the, f to accompany the marches of the American black. And today, I think that the American community, the Jewish community, is very distanced from the uh, economically, um, the economically uh, unable and the uh, socially unable. And the uh, relationship of the Jewish community and the refugees coming in Europe, arriving from Europe, and what? who are the allies that the Jewish community is looking for in the European countries? And this, we are not talking about the country where I live, Israel, where you see groups that are less sensitive to the social are the ones who grow, and uh, less sensitive to the lack of uh, economic power. How can we revert this situation? How can I be less concerned? What's your opinion, please? Thank you. You have just stated precisely the burning problem, a challenge that faces all of us right now in this moment. I would say, first of all, th there are many, many things we could talk for a long time about this. So just to be brief, first of all, what you have said is exactly the problem that was articulated a long time ago by Hannah Arendt. And it seems to me that Hannah Arendt's work is more and more relevant to us today, and all of us should go back and read her analysis. 
the Jewish leadership has not always helped us as Jews. In the United States, Jewish leadership was more concerned with winning government support for the establishment of a state of Israel during World War II than rescuing Jews from Eastern Europe. At the same time, Agudas Yisrael, the organization of Orthodox rabbis, had a march in Washington, D.C. on behalf of Jewish refugees. I think we've always been at both levels. Yes, many Jews marched in Selma. Many Jews were freedom riders. Many Jews were in the South and put their lives on the line and were beaten bloody or were killed. And yet, they were not the Jewish community. In addition, many of them did not realize that the civil rights movement, my father said, was exemplifying the teachings of the Hebrew prophets. Why? Because the rabbis in America didn't say that, didn't teach it to their congregation. Even the young people who went south went not necessarily as Jews or because of Judaism. And that's a tragedy, my father said. What about today? Look, in the 1960s in the United States, there were two main voices. There was Mayor Kahana, who said, never again to the Jews. And there was my father, who said, never again to any human being. We stood at a crossroads. Some went with my father, some went with Mayor Kahana. What do we have today in Israel? Ben Gvir and Smotrich. Kahana, Kahana Chai, I'm sorry. They're going to have predicted 14, 15 seats in Knesset in the next election. This is a shame on the Jewish people. So I agree with your diagnosis. I think we should all again read Hannah Arendt. She puts it very well. And we see we have a lot of work to do within our own people. Too many Jews like to say in America, oh, black people are anti-Semitic. And they don't look at the racism within the Jewish community. And that's a huge problem. And of course, you know, Smotrich and ben are building their political lives on, on racism. So there's much more to say about this. I think you've encapsulated the problem we face today. We have much to do. And I think it's people like Edu, Rabbi Gottfried, this whole congregation. You actually give me a lot of hope. And I appreciate that. We are a community, and you know what? We will prevail. My father said, evil is never the climax of history. We live in an evil era around the world. It's not the end. Wow. Edu. Good evening, Edu. How do you carry out your work inside the favela where you have police and thieves? You exchange uh, shots. And how are you seen by the police and by the thief? You do an incredible work, but you're in the middle of them, in the middle of the noise there. Ah, eu faço parte da sociedade como né, tudo que está lá. And everything there is there. I'm in the middle of everything. I hope they see me with good eyes. What's your name? Alan. Nice to meet you, Alan. Something I learned is the following. And the answer 
is not directly linked to what Susanna said, but I always answer this. The way I speak with Mr. Eli Horn, a great friend I have, a Jew, and he deeply helps us, helps me. He calls me every week to give me uh, targets to know what I did. And every time I come here, I promise that I will come back here because I promised him I would come. And he tells me, Edu, how is the fight with an Arab accent? Do you know that? I said, yes. Edu, it's not only improving poverty, it's winning against poverty. People knows, uh, have to know that they are supported. And uh, you know what will happen to you if you don't uh, succeed. And he tells me, Edu, you will pay for the rest of your days. And I answer here him saying that the same dignity, the respect which we, with which I speak with Eli Horn and with Lehman, with the same words I, I talk and the same dignity I talk with the, uh, the young boy who sells drugs at the door of the school, the same dignity, the, because Destin put him there and the other there but he has to be respected by rich, by the police, and this is what I am, by the drug dealer. This is how I feel, and respect them, because this could be a transitory movement for them, moment for them. And all of this is more difficult in Rio de Janeiro, I have to tell you, but this is another story. And concluding my answer to you, generating falcons, have 300 edu leaders. My work, my work there is to replicate leaders. They were born in the slums and they grew up with a boy who sells drugs. So this is a huge social currency we have to work with the leaderships in our territory. Good evening to all of you. I'm Marcelo. I was born in Ceará, Fortaleza, one of the poorest regions in Brazil in the northeast of our country. And I want to congratulate the Shalom community for this prophetic gathering this evening. And I also want to thank Miriam for the generosity and sympathy. I also want to congratulate Edu and to give, to now say some words to Susana. In the state of Ceará, my state, we had seven concentration camps. They cannot be compared with Germany, but in 1932, 28,000 people died of hunger. And one of these seven concentration camps is where I worked in the city of Fortaleza, which is called the neighborhood of Pirangu. Until today, this is the more densely populated slum in Brazil. In this community, there was a Belgian man who worked with the reality of the place and established a, an institute with several children, and one of the mission is to dialogue with the Jewish people who are old and the chosen people. And uh, But with this dialect, the theology is obsolete. And in the middle of all this, the Heschel group was created in the Catholic uh, University of uh, Fortaleza, and it's directed by Professor Luisa Pereira de Andrade. We had five papers on Heschel, philosophy, theology, two master papers, and the publication of books and articles and courses. We believe that Heschelian thought is a lighthouse in our country in a moment when we need uh, clearness, fight against uh, social inequality, and human sensitivity, I would also like to tell Susan that Heschel is not only in Europe or the 
U.S. Heschel is in Brazil also, and he's a professor of our generation, illuminating the heart of many youngsters, men and women, during our legs tremble in prayer. So this is only a register. I also want to reinstate my uh, congratulations to the Shalom community. I didn't know this. I'm very grateful. Uh, I would also tell you that my father used to say that he felt sometimes better understood by Christians than by Jews. <laughs> I'm very moved to know that my father is so appreciated in Brazil. I didn't know that. Um, I think um, what you describe, I just want to tell you before I came here, a few weeks ago, I met with a colleague, a professor of Portuguese literature, who is from Sao Paulo, and he told me to prepare for this trip by reading Bernardo Kuczynski's book, K. And that book has changed my life, changes the way I'm going to teach my classes in Jewish history. And so it also gave me mm, not just what I knew about Brazil in my head, but also now in my heart. Uh, and I'm given that, I feel as though what you are saying is my father is a path to some healing and some hope. And I thank you so much for being here. I hope we can talk afterwards. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank your testimony. You made me cry. These are sweet tears, and I'm very happy for this uh, meeting, so inspiring, so wonderful, because we are uh, very happy to share it with you and, and with other people in Brazil and in Latin America. And I also want to tell everybody that 20 years ago, we published in 2002 the first book of uh, Abraham Yoshua Heschel, The Last Prophet. After the 5,000 uh, copies that were sold, we published again last year, including other things. In the first the edition, Susanna was very generous and gave us a biography that she wrote for another book. Now she put uh, other special words for this uh, edition in Portuguese. And Professor Feinstein also added a wonderful text saying his uh, Professor Heschel's relevance in Latin America, which is not quite known. And uh, we have a third. Uh, issue wrote, written by Dor Brondi for the Israelis in the Anno Museum in Tel Aviv. They carried out a Heschel uh, symposium, which was led by uh, President Heschel. And this uh, Dor uh, Brondi is translating into Hebrew the book. And part of the introduction here sheds light on that. If you want to have something of Heschel in your home, you can uh, take it with uh, a book with you. She is also giving, a, Susanna is giving a class in a church with 200 reverends, and they bought 200 books. I'm working with our marketing. Please help us uh, solve this unbalance. But in fact, I am very pleased to see how his thought is creative. You know me, but those who do not know me, I want to say that all my life I grew up knowing and hearing about uh, Rabbi Heschel from my master, my teacher, uh, Rabbi Marshall Meyer. And he mentioned every day Professor Rabbi Heschel. I have to to mention the two of them. Some say that I'm crazy with this, and others make this 
their synagogue or their church. I think that this visit will be very important if you want to hear more of Susanna Heschel. Tomorrow we have a luncheon together with the Jewish Federation. No, 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 your book on Jewish feminism, the first one, uh, the reader. The first one on being a Jewish feminist, I have another book. Yeah, my, this one, the original. Which, which year? On being a Jewish feminist, uh, 95, 83 and 95. In 83 to 95, she wrote a book about how to be a Jewish feminist. From 83 to 95, she wrote a book on how to be a Jewish feminist. And the topic of this lunch will be on the new topic, on the new book. She will speak uh, at the Jewish Federation. In the morning, she will open a symposium on at the, the University of Sao Paulo on Heschel, the theologian, and on Thursday, she will speak at the reverence meeting, as I said before. Friday, she will speak at the Catholic University together with Lavoie and Piquet. And uh, she will also speak on Judaism and racism with Lilia Moritz Schwartz. And we'll be able to accompany that. I would like to thank you, all of you who joined us this evening and a round of applause to our important guests.